you know, I'm looking for, uh, you know, some, some fishermen. You, are you any good at it? I don't know anything about fishing. Deathly afraid of sharks. Yeah, there's no sharks in Alaska. <laughs> there's no sharks? <laughs> no, it's too cold. All right, I'm in. Let's do it. Okay, cool. <laughs> Go. We are here for Spartan Up Podcast in Pittsville, Vermont. It is still raining, Joe. but you should come visit, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> even Misty with the rain. Beautiful. Tom Beers, who f started Deadliest Catch. If you haven't seen that on TV, you need to watch it. It's awesome. Okay. I'll tell you a funny story. I don't know if I'm allowed to be telling. So if you're listening to this, that means I got approval. Do you want to tell the story at the end of the interview? Yeah, you know what? I'll tell the story at the end of the interview. It's gonna blow you. It's gonna blow you away. The interview is gonna blow you away. This is a fun interview about. Um, what would you say this well, is about? He, he's a guy who's come up with some of the most incredible shows on television, and he talks about how he was able to do it and just some ridiculous stories along he's the way. Passionate storytelling, and, incredible. And I'm Sephra, by the way, and this is Johnny and Colonel Nye and Joe DeSena <laughs> and Marion here in the camera. We are here for Spartan Up the podcast in Malibu, California behind the scenes Spartan race with Tom Beers. Tom Beers created the truckers. What, what? Ice Road Truckers, Deadliest Catch, Axemen, Storage Wars, Monster Garage, Monster House, Bering Sea Gold, you know, a, a couple of shows. tiny little shows, couple of shows that nobody yeah. really knows. Yeah, yeah. So, so the idea behind this podcast is um, what makes somebody successful? Where, where does this come from? Is it because you were wealthy growing up? You grew up in the right household? What, what was it? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I wish I could say that. No, actually, we were just talking about that earlier. I mean, I, I remember being on welfare when I was in high school, wow. and I worked my way through college as a janitor, you know, mopping floors. So, uh, nah, I wasn't very privileged at all. You know, what I did, though, I was really, really lucky. Um, I got a job working for Ted Turner years ago at Turner Broadcasting and worked my way up to the ranks and eventually became the executive producer of National Geographic Explorer and Audubon and I was Jacques Cousteau's executive producer for six years. But how do you, how do you work up, right? There's four million people watching this. How do you do it? Yeah, well, you know what you do? You do everything, you start at the bottom and you do everything right. That's what you do, I swear to God. It's not, there's no shortcuts. I've always said that when I'm talking to people, you know, they ask me, I say, look, you know what? Life is, it's not a destination, it's just a journey. So everything you do, you do one step at a time and you do it better than anybody else. That's what you do. And if you're driven, you know, you can succeed. And then you gotta get a little lucky. I mean, I got on that boat when I made Deadliest Catch the first time. I gotta be honest, I didn't know what the I was doing. I mean, I got on a boat, a crab boat, in the middle of December in the Bering Sea and I happened to roll in two days, roll into the worst storm in 40 years. I'm sitting on a 120 foot boat with Waves pushing about 40 feet, the winds pushing 70 knots. You know, two boats sunk, seven guys drowned, never even found the bodies. Wow. And all I could do is just keep filming because that's all I knew how to do. Right. And uh, when I came back from that, I realized, man, this is just an amazing world. So, and, you know, then I just kind of had to talk discovery into doing some more. And, you know, I mean, ultimately now I'm in season 11. You know, the show's been won 22 Emmys. Wow. You know, it's it's a it's it's just a behemoth. It's just a juggernaut. But when you so when you say do it better, right? You, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so somebody out there gets a job at the Gap or mm -hmm. McDonald's, right? And they feel like it's a dead end job, and they just kind of sleepwalk through it. What, what do you suggest? Well, I mean, you know, first I, I'd never take a dead end job. You know, I mean, what you want to do is you just gotta go for something that you know. You know, to be honest, maybe it's retail. You know, my wife was retail owned stores for years. She loved it. You know, loved actually rearranging, taking, you know, this product and putting it from here to here every three months. It was like, I, I, you know, I'd shoot myself in the head, you know? So it all depends on what people's passions are. Mine, storytelling. You know, I grew up in a big Italian family. I love storytelling. I was an actor in New York and a playwright and a director. And, you know, I still, I, I narrate all my own shows now. You know, I've always done that, you know? But I'll tell you, that's a funny story, a quick one if you want to yeah, hear yeah, it. Yeah, This is how I got broke into um, narrating my shows. 15, 18 years ago, I hired Scott Glenn to narrate one show for me. It was called Extreme Alaska. Narrated the show, made it 20,000 bucks. He called it pocket change, by the way. He says, I like making this kind of pocket change. $20,000, he worked for two hours, left. Handed the show in a discovery, I was done. Then two months later, I get a call from the network in a panic, going, my God, this show, it's called Extreme Alaska, it's too extreme. I'm like, what do you mean it's too extreme? That's what you asked me to make, and your guys said this is fine, that's what I made. He said, no, we sold it to, to cruise ships and stuff, and you got guys losing their fingers from frostbite, and he's like, no, you can't do that. So I went back, I reshot some stuff, and then I had to find Scott Glenn. 
Well, he was in New Zealand doing that Vertical Limit movie, you know, where he was like yeah, a mountain yeah, yeah. climber. Yeah, yeah. I had to hire a, a, a sound guy with a Nagra to get on an airplane to fly and land on a, on a, on a glacier, walk two miles onto the set, and get me the narration, right? So he gets me, so I'm waiting. The show's on the air Sunday night. I'm waiting. Tuesday, I'm supposed to get the tape. Wednesday, it doesn't show. Thursday, it doesn't show. Friday, it doesn't show. Saturday, I got the tape, the audio tape. Great. Roll it, right? So the first 20 minutes is Scott Glenn. This is bullshit. Uh, you don't pay me enough fucking money to do these re Nobody, this nobody asked me, blah, 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 but he's screaming. So I'm going to read this once. So he reads this, the script, and I go, okay, roll. And he's reading the script, and I realize he only read page two. He didn't even read the first page. So now I'm stuck. The show's on the air the next night. I went, you know what, fuck this. Let me listen to Scott Glenn. I listened to him an hour, for about an hour, and then roll tape. And I did Scott Glenn. Wow. So the first page is me doing Scott Glenn. Nobody knew the difference. And then I realized at that point, it's like, I ain't never looking for some narrator on the glacier <laughs> in New Zealand again. <laughs> I'm doing it. Yeah. So that, that's how I broke into that business. And now I narrate, what, 100 shows a year? I didn't even know you. So you narrate all your own shows? Yeah, except Deadliest Catch. Mike, Mike wrote us Deadliest Catch. But all the other shows are mine, my boy. So um, where do people get this passion from? You've got passion, right? Successful people have passion. How do you, how do you, how yeah. do you get that? You know, can I tell you that I've always said this. Passion is probably the most important thing in the world. You know, it, I, my, my, what I always say is, if it doesn't make your heart pump Kool-Aid or your dick hard, it ain't worth doing. Can we that's put it. this on the film? Is this okay? Oh, shit, sure. <laughs> I mean, I'm serious. If it, that's, it's all about passion. It's got to be that. If you know, uh, you can't. It's just nothing. There's no reason to do anything half-assed. You know, I never. I was. I'm. You know, nah. But you know what? I've always been like this. I didn't give a shit if I was mopping floors or you know. You were into it. Whatever it was. I was into it. Whatever it is, just do it. Do it well. I used to say um, to the employees we, we hire, like, um, no matter what part, what job you're doing, down here, up here, just do it so well that I can't live without you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because then what happens is somebody gets fired, somebody quits, and you're looking around, and it's that guy that's sweeping the floor, but he's passionate about it. Stick him in yeah. running a division. Yeah. Right? But, don't, but, but, but I don't think, the one thing I always hate is when people think they can take a shortcut. And there's right. something else. I've always thought this is interesting. You know the good person that, that shows up is the first one in the morning and the last one to leave at night? Well, don't mistake that for talent. Because I think people make a big mistake that, that ambition equates talent. Because I've had editors who are total drunk. A guy who shows up two hours late, leaves two hours early with a can of beer in his hand. And in that four hours, he gives me more stuff and better stuff than anybody in 10 hours. You know, so in essence, that's the thing you've got to balance. And, you know, it's all about culture, too, you know. Sure. To me, it's developing, you know, a culture, de developing people that have the same passion as you. Because you can't get there alone. I mean, television, my media, it's a collaborative world. You know, and so you need everybody working in the same boat, you know, just like how, you. How many people um, do you have working for you? <laughs> you know, there's a great story about that. You're here. Wait, 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 wait. I'm gonna, we're, take a, we're gonna take a break and then we're gonna come back. I wanna hear the story. I hope you're not sitting still while you listen. If you are, you better get a burpee break in. So, so, yeah, tell me that story. Well, you were asking me, you know, how many people, you know, work for me, and there's an old joke. That uh, I, I asked a guy that once years ago. He had a Remax uh, company in Mexico, uh, real estate. There's a whole bunch of people said, "How many people work for you?" And he looked around the room for about a minute and he said, "About a third. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a good. That's a good. That's a good one. Yeah, about but, a third. That's <laughs> about right. No, but I think it's about two thirds. A third would be a lot, by yeah, the way. Right? Yeah, I know. If you're all print, but you know, at any given time, you know, I've got probably, Jesus, I've got shows in production right now in Alaska in Canada, in Los Angeles, New York, Florida, New Orleans, Oregon, Washington, Wyoming, and Brazil. And how do you, how do you delegate that? How do you manage that? You just get smart people. You know, the whole idea is to always hire people that are smarter than you. Yeah. You know, what the hell? I mean, that's, that's the, hard to, it's hard to find. I mean, not, not to say well, that you know, we're to so be smart. honest, yeah. it's not, it's, it, it might, I think it's more important for them to think they're smarter than you right. than for them to actually be smarter than you. Just, right. you know, let them, let them run. You know, I, I just believe that you hire really good people and you let them run, you yeah. know. And, you know, my job as a CEO is to be a, a cheerleader and a leader, you know. And so I basically it's cheer and leader. You know, those are the two words. Where, where, is there a place I can go to find the really good people? Is there like uh, reallygoodpeople.com or <laughs> where you go? Yeah, yeah, what, yeah. No, man. They find you a lot of times, don't they? I mean, we get, we get 1,500 resumes on a weekend, but um, just because they're passionate about Spartan Race doesn't mean they could sit in an office and, and 
sit in front of a computer, which is a pretty. What do you? What is it? Mostly marketing that you. A ton you have of ton of marketing, uh, sponsorship, um, logistics, moving trucks around, moving people around, mm. dealing with venues, reparation. After we go into a place, we've got to clean up the whole yeah. event afterwards. You know, it's funny you're talking about that because I keep thinking that. You know, that's exactly what the monster truck guys do. And you know what they do also? This is amazing. They actually have, and they got a guy. They have, they have um, Quonset huts in 14 states filled with dirt. Because they realize they use the same. They cover a ball field every time to do this, our stadium. Yeah. But they got to find the dirt. So they decided to own the dirt. So they actually have a vice president of dirt. Wow. That's what his card wow. says. And they load you know, it up in a truck. And they load it up in a truck. They, they load up. They fill up the entire stadium. And then they basically put it back to the Quonset Hut. Because they're going to come back there six months later and do it again. Wow. And then six months after that. It's a special compound, a little bit of clay. So they got, you know, there's some chemistry. It's special, it. special dirt. You yeah. should talk to those guys. Because it might be really interesting just doing some stadium stuff sometimes, you know. Because it got, they already got the infrastructure. It's set up. They yeah. got the camera stuff. It's the yeah. same thing that I'm looking at. You know, it's all dirt. You know, you can build all your old, you know. Yeah, that's interesting. Interesting idea. Yeah, it's an interesting yeah. idea. Yeah. And by the way, it'd be a heck of a lot easier. One of the reasons that the shows work so well for me, like Deadliest Catch, I, and I realized this early on, was that if you can define the workspace and you can confine the workspace. Like on a boat. On a boat. You know, it's a lot easier to film. I mean, Axe Men, I'm like, an, you know, in the old days, I couldn't get there because cameras actually a good are too point. expensive. Right. So basically, if you can confine it, all of a sudden, now you've got something that's made for Manageable. television. Manageable. It's made for television. Anything that's kind of defined and confined. You yeah, know? because we're, we're sometimes over 13 miles. It's That's a challenge. Yeah, yeah, right? exactly. You know, and it's, it's kind of like why uh, Indy Car Racing works here and Grand Prix doesn't. Because right. you can't watch, you're watching one turn in Grand Prix if, right. you're li if it's a live event. Sure. You know, it's, you know, it's the Oval and we're real, in, you know, that's for us. And by the way, what I really love about all my shows, it's kind of like what you do too. And every one of them, if you look at it, I've always treated them like a sporting event. You know, you get a score. How many crab did they catch? Yeah, What's good, the that's a good point. Count? I noticed that you know? on your show, yeah. So all my shows have got the same thing. What was it? Even the storage wars. I mean, right. how many? Bearing say, who, how, who found how much gold? Because guys love scores. Everybody you want to know who won, yeah. who lost, right. you know? And it's all high risk and high reward. So that's pretty much what you're doing, too. It's really funny. We have a ton of competition in this space, and um, we're the only ones that really are focused on the score. Yeah. And that makes a difference. Yeah, it really does. Yeah. 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 Cool. Thanks for coming. Hey, man. That was a awesome. pleasure. I'm looking forward to the hey, race. Hey, what's your favorite exercise? <laughs> Burpees. Burpees. All right. Good stuff. <laughs> yeah. So I got to think this is an incredible story you're going to tell like because Johnny? those stories alone, <laughs> I, I love <laughs> those stories that he told, you know, the, the, the 40 foot waves and the ship and people dying and uh, you've got a story that's more compelling than this. I'm excited. Well, I don't know if it's more compelling, Shackleton. but, but um, he sold his company yeah. and when he sold it, he sold it for tens and tens of millions of dollars. And he said to me, I always wanted to see what it would be like to have, you know, like $40 million in a room. And so he, he told the uh, buyers, can you deliver $40 million <laughs> in cash? <laughs> and they said, well, it's going to cost $10,000. Just to ship it. Yeah. And, and uh, he said, that's okay, I want to do it. And they shipped it. And he said it was this, you know, eight foot high by six foot by six foot pile of $100 bills. And I said, what'd you do? He said, I just walked around just all day. Staring at it. <laughs> staring at it, looking at it. Wow. He said, because I wanted to put it in perspective, so I don't want to be one of those guys that blew all the money because I didn't even understand the significance. I thought, I thought the story was awesome. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know what's actually mean? incredible about that? What a storyteller he is. And yeah. that's the key. You know, he talks well, about that's, his, that's, his, yeah, that's yeah. his career, right? Yeah. But he talked about that. that yeah, that's yeah. what he likes to do. I mean, I don't know if you were familiar with the other show he talked about, Ice Road Truckers. Yep. Have you ever seen that one? Yeah, I yeah. mean, that's... Those guys driving down those roads. That's some, but I mean, he captures those stories. That, you know, just unbelievable. Yeah, driving across frozen lakes and you hear that ice cracking. Yeah. I'm yeah. oh, in. It's like uh, sled dogs, right? The mm -hmm. Iditarod? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Isn't it? Well, that's a different story, but I think they're having. <laughs> but it's a story it's, nonetheless. It's a story. It's a passion. Of Butter, butterflies. Yeah. Ooh, I love butterflies. Okay. So let no. Let's bring it. So, anyways, I love his. It's not a destination. It's a journey. Right? And if you're gonna do something, do it better than anyone else. Joe, yeah. as you said, make yourself invaluable to me. Right. Yeah. yeah. And that's what it's all about. And that's anything that you do. Make yourself invaluable. Make yourself useful. Yeah. And he's and, another uh, bootstrap guy, right? Yeah. He's another he's, guy that. Uh, Trying to remember. I mean, he, he was, worked, worked as a janitor. And yeah, yeah. He worked as a janitor worked his and uh, worked his way up. A little bit of luck. I mean, ending up, oh, on, was ending up on that boat at that time with those terrible storms, right? Ended up with great content. 
Yeah, but he also yeah, he, he, a lot of confidence, success? and, and yeah. I don't I don't mean braggadocio, you know, but he braggadocio. Yeah. Yeah. We'll add that That's to Sephra's the list. Very but good I mean, but, but, thank you, <laughs> <laughs> Sephra. So <laughs> anyway, but I mean, he, he's humble, but he's got the confidence. When he talked about doing the narration, the voiceover. You know, you're talking about Scott Glenn is what he taught, yeah, you know? Yeah. I mean, so you've got a, a well-known awesome actor story. and a great voice and all doing it. And he just, uh, give me some time, I'll do it. And, you know, he took an hour and then he practiced and then he did it. And so that's it. I'm going to do it from here on out. Yeah, I'm going to do it from uh, here on out. Hell, I don't even like I'm doing these intros. <laughs> 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 I'll, 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 practice right? I'll practice your voice. I'll practice your voice. Yeah, good luck. Carl Nye. <laughs> that's not very good. Um, <laughs> but imagine having that great success doing something you love, yeah. which is what he's doing, and, and having so much fun. I mean, that's, yeah. it just sounds like a really fun job. Nat Geo, Audubon, Jacques Cousteau. I mean, those yeah. are some yeah, yeah, he's phenomenal had some, people. That he's, had, he's had a pretty impressive pedagogy. career. So it's also a pretty cool example of once you have some success, how you can start to leverage that. You know, like, I'm sure his first show when he said, I'm going to pitch this show, The Deadliest Catch, and like, you're going to what? And then, like, all the things that, you know, ice road truckers and garage wars and all these things, like, these are kind of crazy ideas, but he's got such a track record that they all work. But you not only get more confidence as the person that's building. Yeah, the backer your, your gets res- more confidence. Yeah, the backer gets more yeah. confidence, people around. Well, you he's get successful, a body work, so that right. must not be a crazy idea. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right? I mean, yeah. what, what, what's the saying? Um, it's not about fishing. It's, insanity is right, it's, 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 it's a oh, borderline. It's, that, do you want the definition of insane? Doing the same thing over and over <laughs> no, again, no, expecting no, different no, results. No, 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 I, I, I know that. No, no, you know, no, no, I, but, I, but, but in this one, there's, there's also the idea of... Um, uh, what is it? Uh, those were thought mad by others yes. who couldn't hear the music. The, the, those dancing were thought mad by those who couldn't hear the music. It's probably you probably have the Canadian version of what I was looking for. <laughs> <laughs> but that's but that's fine. That's Nietzsche, by the way. <laughs> Nietzsche, yeah. yeah. God is dead. Yeah. Okay. Whoa. Well, that's Nietzsche. <laughs> this is one of our most awkward yeah. endings, but let's do it yeah. anyway. Oh, wow. um, blessings. Yeah. I, I don't mean to be offensive. Fantastic I'm just quoting somebody. interview. Uh, incredible guy, and um, you can see him more. You can hear Sephra's other <laughs> provocative <laughs> statements <laughs> at SpartanUpPodcast.com. Nietzsche did say that. <laughs> he did say God, God, is, God is dead. <laughs> All right. Long live who? Sorry, Mary. <laughs> Thank you for listening to another epic story of success. Find show notes, video, and audio from this episode at SpartanUpPodcast.com. Slash 076. The Spartan Up Podcast is brought to you by Spartan Race. Isn't it time you found your true north? Sign up for Spartan X. Oh.